in our last video, we strongly agreed with Jordan Peterson and disagreed with Hans Georg Muller that wokeism was indeed a postmodern thing. But then we agreed strongly with Hans Georg Muller and disagreed with Jordan Peterson on the question of whether wokeism was a Marxist thing, and we said that it wasn't. But in doing so, we only considered one of Peterson's arguments to make that connection. And that's what I've called his argument from derivation, which is basically Jordan saying, look, there were these bunch of intellectuals in the middle half of the 20th century in France. They were Marxists. They fancied the Soviet Union. Then they fancied the Soviet Union less and progressively took on postmodernist and post-structuralist ideas or developed them. And we concluded last time that that was certainly proof of derivation, how one thing has come from another, but it wasn't proof of a more substantive connection. And so we disagreed and dismissed that argument. But Jordan Peterson has another argument to connect Marxism with wokeism, and we'll consider this argument now, and afterwards we'll sketch a cartoonish account of what wokeism really is, in my opinion, and in doing so we'll stay on course with our assumption that um, linking Marxism and uh, workism ain't terribly helpful in explanatory terms. So let's hear briefly from Jordan Peterson. And what happened, as far as I can tell, is that the idea of economic conflict was replaced by the idea of power, that, that the most important element of an individual isn't their individual identity, but the group that they belong to, the racial group, the ethnic group, um, the, the gender, um, the sex, the sexual preference, doesn't matter, some element of group identity, and that the world is best construed as a battle for power between these different groups. And I don't see that there's really much difference between the proposition that History was driven by economic conflict between the oppressor and the oppressed, and the claim that history is driven by power relationships between the oppressor and the oppressed. So let's not consolidate what Jordan Peterson has said here into marble and hold him to it, because it's an answer to a Q&A, which um, shouldn't be held to greater account than just a couple of tweets. So he has the right to expand and elaborate his position ongoingly. But just from what Jordan says here, yeah, is not enough. So he would be stopped, certainly by me or by other reasonable people, if this was said in a sophisticated um, environment, in a um, philosophical seminar or over dinner, because power relations between groups just ain't enough to create a constitutive link with Marxism. If anything, the first thing I'm going to think of with the picture that Jordan paints ain't Marxism, but fascism. Because there you've got an expression of a group's authenticity, a group's identity, a group's collective will, the proclamation that the project of that group is noble. And then there are other groups out there which are a great deal less noble, with all kinds of project that, projects that must not get in the way of the project of the noble group rightly expressing its will and destiny and authenticity. And if the less noble group's enterprise gets in the way of the collective self-realization of the noble group, then no costs are too great to clear the way. So we've got a situation of power relations plus a kind of elevated notion of authenticity-derived group identity. So that's at least as plausible as the Marxist connection. And in fact, it isn't an accident that Chuck Taylor, at least in his private views, I'm not sure if he's come out with this in, in print, he may well have done, and you know, Charles Taylor is the most admired, not just Canadian philosopher, but one of the two or three most admired living philosophers, and I'm sure Jordan Peterson admires him too. But his view certainly is that if there is a politics that naturally goes together with postmodernism, that politics is fascism. And insofar as wokeist acting out is indeed a postmodern thing, which is what we've been arguing in the last episode, 
um, then that's just at least as plausible a connection as the Marxist link. So let's say a little bit more. Now it's worth saying that because the natural political ally for postmodernism is such an unlovely kind of politics, it's because of that that postmodernism ends up trying to cling on to holier-than-thou political commitments in practice, commitments that are maximally inclusive, universalist, maximally involved in the most ambitious forms of social justice. Now, in practice, um, postmodernists have come in different shapes and sizes, and some of them have been more serious than others. Jacques Derrida, for example, was a genius and a slut, which is to say not that he was a slut and a genius, but that he was a genius at being an intellectual slut. He was a great pop star. I'm going to make a video at some point on him. But Michel Foucault was a very deep and serious thinker, no matter how far you go along with his ideas. And he has left us grateful for many resources he's uh, left behind that help us understand the way power works, the way power transforms discursive and conceptual practices, the way power forms new kinds of social subjects and so on. So to Michel Foucault, we're grateful. But it's true both for Derrida and for the serious man, Foucault, that on the basis of their philosophical commitments, actually no concept of social justice that's workable is available to them because in the end, they're going to be stuck, they're going to be clogged in to the story that there is no way to break out of an explanation of what's going on, except in terms of mere power relations. What we've said so far, of course, does not establish or even seek to establish that workism is fascist. It just establishes that the link between workism and Marxism is no more compelling than the link between workism and fascism. But what is the best way to frame what wokeism is in historical and cultural terms? I am close to the views of the British public intellectual John Gray in thinking that the starting point for a conversation like that about what wokeism is, where it's come from, where it's going and how we might respond to it, has to be the understanding that wokeism ain't Marxism, that it ain't leftist, but that it's rather a kind of liberalism that's gone crazy and become the reverse of itself. A kind of liberalism that aiming at a maximization of liberal values in a hyperactive way has toppled itself around itself hyperactively so much that it's come to be aimed not at liberalism but at liberticide. Liberticide is a word that John Stuart Mill used in the middle of the 1850s before he, a um, little later on in that decade, wrote his great book on liberty. And now, in the next few minutes, what I want to frame is exactly how this kind of picture of wokeism as liberalism in reverse might be made sense of via looking at the conception of history that wokeism goes with and comparing it to the teleological conceptions of history that Marxism goes with and indeed the teleological conceptions of history that liberalism often go, goes with. And in doing so, we will again circle back to possible connections that there may be, there won't be any, between Marxism and wokeism. So let's say a little bit more. Framing the wokeist conception of history is difficult because their conception of history is soaked in magical thinking and their idea of the future is transferred into a kind of place that's suspended outside the realm of cause and effect. Because with Marxism, you have a teleological conception of history as a series of stages that culminates in one final stage. We don't have that much 
meat on the bone for Marx about what that final stage will look like. But there is an historically robust conception that's wrong, but clear, and on the way produces extravagantly lucid social and economic analyses, um, the clear conception of an historical progress where you move from one stage to another. You've got a similar story with liberalism. In 1989, Francis Fukuyama famously wrote an article that was so delusional that he's had to water down his position every five years since he wrote it. But at the time, he argued that in principle, if not in practice, the world was converging, had a tendency to converge on something like a species-wide civilization that expressed a particular form of democratic capitalism. And now, wokeism thinks of the future and it doesn't. Insofar as it does, it does have a teleological conception. Because after all, you constantly hear these wokeist pronouncements about folks being on the right side of history. We are on the right side of history. Okay, how do you know? So there is an underlying commitment to teleology, but then there is also a tendency in a kind of thinking it makes it so sort of way to have a conflictive double think whereby one goes with teleology but also doesn't go with it and is just happy to confine oneself to a particular kind of therapeutic expression in the present which is going to lead to whatever it leads to in the future and it will lead to the right kinds of things because I'm on the right side of things on the right side of history and so on. Now if we were to give a definition, an elevator pitch length definition of workism, I'd say it's something like this. Fukuyamian liberalism plus a narcissism that is an expression of the value of authenticity in the distorted form. To conclude, we've got to talk about workism more. Why? Because it is a symptom of an irreversible trajectory of democratic decline in Western liberal democracies. It's a decline that we can partially reverse partially hold, but it is broadly inevitable. This is a time when Western liberal democracies are moving from the safety of a bay to being out in open water, in open ocean. Now, that don't mean they're going to sink. It don't mean they're going to drown. But it does mean that the conditions will be new and we have to be ready for these conditions. Our culture has to be ready for these conditions. Our institutions have to be ready and robust in the face of these conditions, just at a time when people are progressively losing trust in our institutions. Now, on this channel, we'll be arguing that the greatest threats to Western liberal democracy come from the anti-democratic right, not from the center or from the left. But nevertheless, I also will make the argument many times over on this channel that there has rarely been a time in history when the center and the left have collectively, collectively been so deluded about what's actually going on in their societies. So many people are stuck in 2008 or 1998 and are simply unable to process how the deformations in their democracies are occurring, how the conflicts in their democracies are manifesting themselves. And they're putting all of this down to um, ignorant voters that vote the other way, irrational people who have the wrong facts. Well, there's some of that for sure, but that doesn't explain what's really going on. And the funny thing is that the least woke people about this matter of making sense of where we're at now are the people we have in this video been uh, calling uh, as the wokeism movement. Um, I look forward to chatting with you on this and other important topics next time. Thanks so much for your attention.